Welcome to the lecture series on evolution. So this unit, we're going to be talking about evolution, the theory of evolution, and what it is, the basic concepts behind it, a little bit of the history of evolution, and how we actually can watch evolution occurring in, in some cases, and ways we extrapolate for the process of evolution when we can't sit down and physically watch it occur. So in the course of the entire semester, we've talked about and looked at different theories. The germ theory, theory of genetics, theory of what we call it the uh, laws of probability. We talked about thermodynamics, all these things that are supported by massive amounts of scientific evidence. And generally nobody ever says, well, it's just a theory, so I don't believe in it. Well, gravity is just a theory, or people will say it's a law. Well. If we use the term theory of gravity, nobody says, it's just a theory, I don't believe it, because it's just a theory. Evolution is a theory. When we use the word theory in science, it means it is supported by massive amounts of evidence. It is not a guess. It's not something that we say, well, we maybe... Theory means supported by evidence. So... As we get into this unit, this is the one where people often say, well, I don't believe it because it's just a theory. Then you'd say the same thing about your medical care. When the doctor says you're sick, they're basing it on the germ theory. Well, I don't believe I have a bacterial infection because it's just a theory about bacteria causing illness. No, it's, it's supported by evidence, and so is evolution. Theory of evolution has been supported by evidence continues to be supported by more and more lines of evidence every day. It is solid. It is grounded in science and the scientific process. Now, I'm not going to say that there are not parts of it where we say, well, that didn't make sense and maybe that doesn't work. But to throw out an entire theory because you find one exception to the rule is not good science. We wouldn't do that with diseases and say, well, we thought it was a bacterial infection. Turns out it wasn't. We wouldn't say, well, let's forget the theory, the germ theory, and forget how we do modern medicine. So I want you to keep that in mind when we're talking about evolution. This is not a guess in the scientific community. This is grounded in science. So the first thing we have to do is start out with what is evolution? What is the basis of this idea? What are we looking at? And what I want you guys to focus on, we could put little red stars around this if you want, Evolution is the change in the genetic frequency of a population over time. <clears throat> and when I use the word time, think about generations. Do not think about years because, you know, oak trees, you're not going to get generations very quickly. Humans, whales, elephants. We don't have a new generation that quickly. So time, or I'm sorry, in time. So time is really not the main thing to say, well, it has to happen in the next 10 years. It may take hundreds of years for certain species to evolve. But other things that go through generation cycles instantly, bacteria, 20 minutes, then we can see evolution happening in front of our eyes. This is why antibiotics are not as effective as they used to be. Bacteria have evolved because they reproduce and they go through a generational cycle so darn quickly. So, all right, so evolution is not a new thing. Man has been trying to understand life since as far as we can tell. Ancient Greeks were trying to understand life and trying to understand the relatedness of life on Earth. Why do we see all these things on this planet? How did they get here? What's the reason we have this biodiversity? And the earliest explanations were always based upon myth and religion. You know, how did it come to be? Well, there, there's this idea, this thought. Uh, the Mayan story of creation. It took the gods, and they have multiple gods in the religion. It took the gods four attempts to create man, and it evolved the clay jar or clay jug at the river and the jaguar that broke the jug and kept breaking the jug until finally the gods got it right and created the human form. 
is that the right way to think about life beginning on this earth? Because in the course of the earth's history, millions of people believe that. There are still people on earth today who do believe that. But can we support it with science? No, we can't. We can't support that concept with scientific methods. You can't run an experiment to test for the clay jug and the jaguar at the river and the gods creating man. So if we can't test it scientifically, we don't bring it into the scientific realm. It's not to say it's not a great belief, but it's not a scientific or a scientifically supportable concept. So they said humans have been trying to sort this out since they first really started trying to understand themselves and life on Earth. Um, some of the key ones we want to talk about go back to the 1800s, when the scientific method really starts rolling and more and more people are approaching things from a scientific perspective. Back in the 1800s, we have a gentleman named, named George Cuvier. Cuvier came up with this idea called catastrophism. Now, he thought that all life on Earth was created at the same time. <clears throat> okay? Everything. Everything. Oh, sorry, I spelled this wrong. Catas. Oh, T. All right, catastrophism. He thought everything was created on the Earth at the same time. So the dinosaurs and the fish and the birds and the humans and the primates and the bacteria and the plants and the fungi and everything. 1.8 million species on Earth all at the same time. And species are fixed and do not change. They don't change over time. There's, there's no change to a species. And he was backing this up saying, you know, the Earth is only 6,000 years old. You can't change a species in 6,000 years. It's not enough time. There's not enough time for generations. How can elephants go through enough generations to change if the Earth's only been around for 6,000 years? But the reason why we have some things in the fossil record that are not on the planet today is because of natural disasters. Catastrophes. Now we see these happening all the time. Wildfires in California, earthquakes, landslides, Tornadoes, volcano eruptions, the Earth is constantly producing natural disasters. Cuvier felt that is why species went extinct, not species changing, but species went extinct because of these disasters. So in catastrophism, in that concept, the species diversity on Earth will continuously decrease as they continue to get wiped out by natural disasters because there's no new species being produced, no new species evolving, our species diversity count will continue to go down. So catastrophism was widely accepted in the early 1800s by lots and lots of people. It fit social belief, it fit the current religious belief at that time, you know, this 6,000-year-old earth is directly based off of biblical aging. You know, if you go into the Bible and look at how many generations have occurred, the Archbishop Bishop of Armagh actually calculated the date of the earth's formation to October 21st, um, 4004 B.C., and that's where they're saying, you know, this is when the earth was created and everything started. So it had huge popularity for a long time because it made people comfortable with it fitting their belief system. Now, in the 1800s as well, we get another individual named Lamarck, Jean-Baptiste Lamarck, and he proposed a different idea. He came up with this idea called the inheritance of acquired characteristics. He felt the environment can produce these changes in an organism that are inheritable. And his idea or his example was a giraffe. So the giraffe had a short neck. The original giraffe ancestor had short neck. And in order to get food, that individual giraffe could stretch its neck 
and reach the leaves that were a little bit higher and then a little bit higher and then a little bit higher and it stretched its neck out during the course of its life to make the neck bigger and bigger and longer and longer and longer and that's why we have long neck giraffes living today because the short neck giraffes literally stretched their neck out and made it longer and it was the environment that was driving this change because in order to survive and continue to live and reproduce you had to stretch your neck out in order or in a sense you had to adapt to the environment and that's what changed you as a organism so Lamarck was getting close to the actual idea of evolution he's saying things change organisms can change but that's the problem an individual can't change their genetics we have the DNA we're always going to have. It's set at fertilization. Our genetics are set. Now you can pass on certain parts of your DNA to your offspring, which parts get passed is a lot of chance, but you can't actually change your DNA and change your physical traits. So if I wanted wings, I can't just sprout wings because I really, really want them. And that's what Lamarck was saying. One way this was tested scientifically and shown not to be accurate was an experiment with mice. Scientists took a mouse, cut the tail off the mouse, said we're going to change its genetics or we're going to change its physical features. We remove the tail. Now when that mouse has babies, if Lamarck is correct, those babies should not have tails. But mice babies were born with tails. So science was used and in that case, scientific experiment, the data collected rejected this idea called the inheritance of acquired characteristics. Okay. So now in the mid, about the mid 1800s, along comes this young man named Charles Darwin. He is a name behind evolution. He is not the only one. His grandfather actually proposed this idea and lots of other scientists contributed information. But Darwin is the one who really took it, put it together, kind of packaged the concept, and was able to present it in a way that made sense. So Darwin jumps aboard this boat called the HMS Beagle in 1831, and his job was to be the ship's naturalist. Basically sail around the southern hemisphere with the English Navy and collect stuff, identify it plants and animals and resources that the British Navy could use. They're exploring new trade routes in the Southern Hemisphere, etc. And as Darwin is collecting these specimens, he starts asking lots of questions. What about this? This doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. And what he's seeing is kind of conflicting with his religious upbringing. Because he was brought up to have the same religious beliefs as most people in England in the 1800s. He was presented with catastrophism. That's what you're supposed to believe. Okay. But what he's seen, what he's, he's witnessing, the evidence doesn't fit the belief of catastrophism. So Darwin actually went to college. He wasn't a good student at all. Started out, went to school to become a doctor, didn't make it, crashed and burned, bails out. Goes back to school to go into theology. Gets through, you know, gets his degree, but just wasn't a good student. But what he did love were his science courses. He took several of them multiple times just because he wanted to learn it better and better and better. So he does his journey and he's collecting evidence. So he's got a scientific background because of his education and that evidence he's collecting raises a lot of questions for him. What about this? What about that? What about that? And he uses a scientific approach to try to answer those questions. That's the big difference here. He was not basing it on myth, religion, a belief system. He was basing his views about evolution or about this, these things he was seeing on science. That's the key. If you cannot test it, cannot design an experiment and test for it, then it doesn't fit into the scientific realm. So we'll talk about what Darwin did on his journey on the HMS Beagle and the different things he found and discovered and how it built towards his concept of 
evolution.